I'm going to go. Okay. All right. Go. All right, great. Yeah, the first computer I ever used was an HP 2000 time sharing machine. It looked something like this. Um, actually, I think it looked like that. I never saw it. Uh, I dialed into that computer literally with a dial telephone. Uh, this would be in the early 1970s, and we were operating at 110 baud or 10 characters per second using the then ubiquitous teletype. Uh, for those of you who've never seen one or have forgotten, this is about how those things, how fast. This is, uh, this is listing a program. I'm not going to make you suffer through this for very long, all right? But you can get, that is very, very, very painfully slow. Uh, nonetheless, I was absolutely transfixed, and I knew that I was going to do computers uh, in some form or another for the rest of my life. Um, so at my high school, so I actually went to a, a second high school then. It, my dad got transferred, and I entered a vocational computer uh, operations and programming uh, thing that was half, half of the school day. And I actually got my hands on a real computer, an NCR Century 200, one of the seven dwarfs alongside IBM NCR made computers. This is about the same as that computer. Those uh, disk drives on the right had 4.3 megabytes of capacity. The entire machine had 32K of RAM, oh, excuse me, 32K of core memory. And that core memory uh, had, could, you could fetch 1 million uh, core memory reads or writes per second. Um, it also had a console. And you actually interacted with the operating system through the console by storing into memory locations to tell it to do things. It also had a stop button, and when you press the stop button, it stopped. <laughs> okay? Uh, there was also a certain retrograde thing that happened. I had to start punching cards. Yes, I communicated with computers by punching holes in cardboard. Uh, for those of you old timers, you may remember this, a key punch machine. Uh, computers were far too uh, expensive and important to, to uh, waste their time reading my input, so I had to prepare it offline. Uh, this didn't have any kind of backspace or anything, so if you made a mistake, you had to, you had to ditch the card. There was a much more expensive key punch that actually had a backspace. This, this key punch costs, in today's terms, about $10,000, which is kind of incredible. The machine also had a teletype. Teletypes actually predate computers. I don't know if you know that. Uh, let's revisit cards for a second. This punch card uh, can store 960 bits of information, or 120 bytes. Okay, that means a deck, which is 2,000 cards, which actually was quite heavy, <coughs> stores about 240 kilobytes if you're storing binary, about 15 seconds of MP3 audio, or two, th yeah, 15 seconds on a very heavy multi-pound deck, or 2,000 lines of source code. Source code went a lot further. Um, all the C files in user source, I just did a quick count of uh, FreeBSD 9, about 8.5 million lines of code. So that would be 4,250 boxes of punch cards to represent the source code to the operating system. Um, I got a job uh, using a Honeywell 2020 computer and programming it in COBOL. It looked like this, except we didn't have the tape drives and we didn't have the bouffant. Um, you'll, <laughs> You'll notice on the right a, a very, very large card hopper because you fed a lot of punch cards into that thing. It had two 10 megabyte drives. It had 8K bytes of memory when I got there, and I uh, got them to upgrade it to 12K bytes of memory for, for a couple things. Um, this was the console. I think it's simultaneously science fiction-y and toyish. Like, there's not enough buttons on there, right? Um, this machine was also used by the FAA, and there are still echoes of the legacy of this machine in their XML flight data uh, today. Uh, at the university, I, I used the first, you know, a mainframe, what was called a mainframe then, a CDC 6600. Um, and it looked pretty much like in the lower left here, uh, you know, a big machine, about nine MIPS, uh, 1965, all done with discrete transistors and resistors, not even integrated circuits, and it was that fast. Uh, the 6600 actually is the first RISC machine. Seymour Cray, absolutely a genius. On the right, you see a bank of switches. That's the boot program to, uh, for the bootloader. So you actually, you know, memory was hard to come by and things, so you could toggle in your, your bootloader and then the machine can boot. All right, 
So, um, you know, sure, these machines were primitive, and it's easy to eye roll them, right? But they were also pretty extraordinary. Like the Honeywell machine had a full ANSI COBOL compiler that ran in 12K of memory. All was not well, though. Every machine had its own operating system. And if a vendor decided to make a new architecture, they made a new operating system. Machine dependencies and word, side, word size dependencies crept into programs, even if they were written in standard languages. Switching costs were huge, and machines were super expensive. The 6600 cost several dollars a minute to operate. All right. So by now, I had written software on a lot of different machines. And this is kind of what documentation looked like back in the day. This is actually some of the better documentation from the 1970s. Um, in particular, we're looking at a date function. And this is for the CD6600. And it actually came packed into a word because the machine didn't address bytes. And there's the year and the month and the day. And, and clearly, we're absolutely dependent on a 60-bit word size, and then we have to unpack the fields that we want. Notice it also has a two-digit uh, year. This is what you had to set up to open a file. Uh, and this was repeated in about every operating system I had seen. Some kind of file control block that was very haphazard. For example, you might have the eight characters of the file name in one place. You might have the extension in another place. You might have the drive ID in one place and the drive number in another place. So you end up writing a lot of code to just create the scaffolding in order to get a file open. All right. Uh, now, some other guys were using teletypes at the same time, and they were uh, doing some really interesting work. Uh, they invented a systems programming language called C, and they used that to write an operating system called Unix. Uh, they did that uh, a lot at 10 characters per second, which I think is kind of an incredible, it's kind of incredible to think about how slow the machines were while those guys were inventing that. Um, Around 1979, at Indiana University, the chairman of the computer science department asked me to go over and look at the sociology department. They had bought a PDP-1144, and they wanted to get this version 7 Unix installed on it. Pretty daunting task, but I got it going, and I was just blown away by it. Um, this was the man page for version 7 for the read system call. Uh, for those of you who are programmers, uh, you know, no longer are we, in, you know, dependent on the block size of the machine. We can address anywhere into the file as an array of bytes. We can read as many bytes as we want. Even though the largest drives of the day were only a few hundred megabytes, files could be gigabytes in size as designed by these guys. This was as simple as I could imagine it, and um, I thought it was pretty incredible. You know, if you logged into that version 7 machine, you probably get bored pretty quickly because there's no, there was no internet. But uh, <laughs> you'd actually be able to get around and it would be pretty damn familiar. Uh, there's a path environment variable. There's programs in slash bin and slash user bin. Uh, your shell was slash bin slash sh. And you'd have things like ls and cd and pwd and grep and fine and awk and yak and cc, of course. I think it's remarkable, it's 36 years later, those paradigms have endured, and they don't feel broken or turgid. Uh, I left the university in 1980, and I wanted to own a Unix system, but I had to settle for an Apple II due to costs. Um, I'm not complaining. I learned a ton from the Apple II. But I had a persistent desire to own a Unix system, and I kept my eye on the options. One was the Fortune Systems computer. This is about $15,000, or about $45,000 in today's money. Um, that was kind of a non-starter for me. I thought they butchered the Unix too much, and plus, I had to have a hard drive. I mean, five megabytes minimum. OK, another uh, option was the Zilog System 8000. That was about 10000 to start. Didn't even include a terminal. Um, and the terminal, you can see on the left there, a Lear Siegler ADM3, 24 lines, 80 characters. Uh, and that was 1000 bucks, or about 3000 bucks today, just for that terminal. So I kept going on my Apple II and later an Amiga, and, um, and still wanting to run Unix. OK, so then the IBM PC AT came out. 
And that was the first Intel processor that was actually capable of running a protected mode multitasking operating system. So I figured eventually Unix would be available. Those, those machines still were very expensive. But clones began to become relatively affordable. A company called Microport started advertising Unix for $200. I called them to inquire about it. And then a few days later, I got a call from them that said, are you buying or what? I was kind of blown away that they would call, but I guess they were actually interested in making sales. So I said, okay. I ported my BBS from Fido to Unix, and I got onto Usenet, and I got email onto the internet, and I was on a path to my first business. There's like the boot screen from Microport. I was in a System 5 world because that's what I could get to. I learned a lot, as before, and I started the work that I've done on the Tickle programming language then, and I got to know System 5 really well, and also Xenix and other variants. By 91, I had an internet connection at a stunning 960 bytes per second and $500 a month, and in 1992, uh, 386 BSD was released. So my friend Nick Handel, his name really is Nick Handel, and I uh, downloaded that and it took 24 hours and we loaded it onto about a kajillion floppies and we loaded it onto this 386 SX computer and before long we had booted 386 BSD. Now, uh, it would only run for about 20 minutes and then it would panic, but by God it didn't lose files. And, you know, that would, have been a, that would have been a showstopper. I would have been gone. But it would reboot time and time and time again, and the files would all be there. And you, you stood a decent chance of getting the kernel built before it would crash. Patches, yeah, <laughs> patches were flying. And after a few days, it could stay for hours. And after a few weeks, it could stay for days. Today, of course, it can stay for years. I was collecting, testing, and distributing patches, and I was kind of competing with this fellow, Jordan Hubbard. Uh, his, his experience was clearly superior to mine, and, and after a while, I semi-gracefully demurred, and uh, he went on, of course, to be a major influence with FreeBSD and then at Apple. Uh, one thing that became clear to me, BSD was better than System 5. Uh, you know, the free aspect was incredibly alluring because the microport, even at 200 bucks, was really about 900 bucks by the time you got your compiler and stuff. And as a developer, I began to notice these differences, like, hey, PS has these different arguments. And then you read the man page, and the Berkeley PS, you could specify the fields that you wanted, uh, which was great if you wanted to parse that with the program. Um, Another example was shared memory. System 5 shared memory was really weird. Uh, the man pages were weird, and I thought I could see the degradation of Unix after it had been passed from the researchers to the business people at AT&T. The System 5 shared memory creates this token, and then you have to create your own mechanism to pass that token around to different programs if they're going to share the memory, unless they're children, whereas in, with Berkeley, you have the nmap system call and um, use the file system and use the permissions of the file system. It was so much better. So I came from System 5 by necessity, but BSD won me over with its superior technology. So now it's 93, and I started an internet service provider called NeoSoft, and we ran it mostly on PCs running FreeBSD and BSDI, which was the commercial version of BSD that Rob Kolstadt and some of the CS com computer systems research group people at Berkeley made, they had a driver for a T1 card. <laughs> that was a big deal for us. We made ter terminal servers, we made routers, we made shell account servers and later web servers and we ran them on FreeBSD. Um, while this was going on, I remember reading about a Linux bug in the mid 90s where if you unmounted for, for a while, there was this, you know, if you had the latest stuff and you unmounted your file systems, like you ran shutdown, it would destroy your file systems. You were safe as long as the machine crashed, but if you shut it down, it would destroy, it destroyed the machine. And at this point, the, these FreeBSD and BSCOS were mission critical for us. It absolutely freaked me out, and that could have destroyed our business, that kind of bug. A uh, little Ken Thompson quote, really mean about Linux. Um, Linux is quite unreliable. Microsoft is really unreliable, but Linux is worse. Now that's from 99, uh, but, but I'm going to take some more shots at Linux uh, later in the, in the presentation. Um, 
We also uh, tried Solaris on a server that Compaq gave us, and uh, we also had some Spark servers, and it was extremely frustrating because as a web server, uh, Solaris didn't work very well. Like the windowing code for TCP sessions to kind of get the bandwidth to the, to the size of the full data pipe would cause it to be really slow with those web requests, which were really short connections, and it took Sun forever to fix that. Uh, we still did run some Solaris to get RAID, like on our new server before, you know, we had software RAID. Um, also, this is kind of interesting. So at the time, we were, you know, we were a small company, and it's really hard to get credit to buy equipment. And so Tandem came to us, and they were like, hey, we'll loan you hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy our equipment. We want you to buy our nonstop servers. And we looked at that and said, no way, we're not touching that. They said, okay, okay, well, we also have some rebadged SGI gear and we were pretty interested in that. So we looked at it really carefully. Uh, but then like a VME bus ethernet interface card from, from Tandem for the SGI was $40,000. And we, we were buying ethernet cards for PCs for $100. Um, 400 times less money. Best internet, uh, which some of you may have heard of out in California, they drank the Kool-Aid and they later junked hundreds of thousands of dollars of kit in favor of running BSD on commodity PCs. So there was some concern in our camp that AT&T would win. There was a, a kind of notorious lawsuit against BSDI over like 30 lines of code that they didn't get taken out, you know. And, and BSDI said it's Unix, and so they got in trouble for some trademark stuff. And we thought they might wreck the free BSDs. And our plan then was to migrate to Linux, but fortunately AT&T lost and we never needed to. So we sold Neosoft in 99, and it was a, it was a good outcome. Um, after a vacation, Daniel Baker and I created a company. We decided we were going to go called SuperConnect, and we we're going to go off and write software for the cable TV industry to help them with their internet, to troubleshoot their problems, and stuff like that. We built a standalone appliance that ran BSD, and um, we had pretty good luck selling it, but we couldn't make any money at it. And we, we built this really large system for hundreds of thousands of dollars. We sold one. And uh, we learned this really bitter lesson, which is that nobody goes to work for the cable TV company because they love cable TV. <laughs> anyway, a side project of ours was rapidly eclipsing the possibilities of SuperConnect, and that was FlightAware. Okay, so this is what FlightAware looks like today. This is the home page. It's, uh, we uh, track about 100,000 flights a day. We keep every piece of data we receive uh, from every source in the world. We, have, uh, we get data from directly from the aviation authorities of Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, 36 countries in Europe. We have our own telemetry gear. Uh, we have deals with most of the satellite tracking companies. And we take all that data together uh, according to various rules and various things and, and try to produce a, a picture of what's actually happening. You know, if you, uh, you know, if you call your airline, hey, is my flight on time? Or you go to the website and they say yes. You go to FlightAware and we say, you know, it's an hour late. I promise, it's an hour late. <laughs> all right, here's a flight from today, Air Canada 442. This is like what a, what a typical tracking page is. You see the weather overlay there. Um, actually coming here, uh, that's a flight I wasn't able to be on. And, uh, <laughs> And we, and we have all this history and stuff. And, and uh, there were other people trying to do this stuff, but they didn't keep the history, and they didn't, um, they didn't try to like, normalize and rationalize it. You know? So, so like, uh, almost every flight ends in the FAA canceled. Uh, not really canceled, they just kind of cancel it once they don't need to track the flight anymore because it landed. So we changed canceled to mean arrived uh, most of the time, and many things like that. Well, the first FlightAware server was really tiny. It was a single 1U server, two, uh, two Pentium processors at a gigahertz, two gigs of RAM and 80 gigs of disk. And, and original FlightAware looked like this. Um, and you can tell that we're a bunch of engineers and not graphic designers. We hired all the pretty graphics. Um, we were having a closed beta. We were telling people, hey, check this thing out. Just don't tell anybody. 
And then, uh, you know, one day somebody told someone and, and forgot to tell them not to tell anybody, and it got, it got posted onto a Microsoft Pilots mailing list, and we had thousands of registrations in one day. And that's when we said, hey, we got to quit uh, goofing around and get serious and make this thing into a business. Um, so let me, it's, Flight Alert, we're totally self-funded. We made a pilgrimage out to Sand Hill Road to meet the venture capital guys, and we were pretty bummed out. Uh, to be honest, the, uh, uh, one of the guys said, um, well, if we fund you, you'll switch to Linux. That's a no-brainer. And, and I'm like, so this is, the, this is their value add, right? That this, you know, this guy who does not use these things. I mean, just the switching cost for us would have been enormous. I'm not even running Linux down there. Just we already really knew BSD. Uh, and we're still self-funded. All right. Today, uh, FlightAware, our Quantcast ranking is around 700. It kind of goes up and down depending on what's going on. Uh, that's uh, like the 700th most popular site in the United States. It's a top 100 site by page views because a lot more people look at our pages. Um, for many hours every day, we do 250 pages a second. And uh, our pages are pretty high overhead compared to a site like CNN or some site that just is a content management system. Uh, many, many, many of our users are logged in. We have millions of registered users, so they're getting a custom page. Um, a typical page has dozens of SQL queries, uh, so that's kind of cool. All right, and here is, here is the guts of FlightAware. All right, it's five racks in a data center, and um, it's mostly Dell hardware. It, there's also some old commodity PCs, We've kind of evolved toward Dell because the, the big commodity servers uh, don't cool properly. And uh, I'll tell you, those, uh, those little memory fans that have blue LEDs in them and stuff, those are not, uh, they, those do not last. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't actually work in data centers. Um, you can see on the, um, in the middle there, I mean on the right, eh, I don't even remember. Okay, yeah, there's, a, there's a, some big storage servers using Nexinta. Uh, and we're using blade servers, but pretty much every server in there is running BSD. We have about half again, about half that much in Dallas, and we've got about a quarter that much in Europe, and, uh, and then we uh, leverage a CDN. Okay, so a question that comes up, why don't you do it all in the cloud with something like Amazon or something? After all, their ops guys are better than your ops guys. Well couple things. The cloud didn't exist in 2005 when we started. I mean, not as a, not as a service. Uh, also, you have to pay uh, backhaul. That is, you have to send the data to your cloud provider. And, and you, can get, you can end up having to pay for a lot of data movement that isn't actually going out to your users. Uh, and this is a big deal for us. They're vulnerable to epiphenomena or uh, failures of the management software. You know, if they're administering hundreds of thousands of nodes, that software is a source of failure, and there have been multi-day Amazon outages. Uh, there's also a favorable tax, tax treatment, at least in the United States, for owning your own hardware. And I'll say this, my guys might not be as good as their guys, but when my stuff is down, my guys are working on it. You know, if, you can get it, right? If my stuff is down, hosted at Amazon, they're working on getting the whole thing up, or they're working on getting their favorite thing up, or they're getting, working on getting the biggest customer up. Um, let's talk about Linux and BSD today. Uh, Ubuntu destroys file system on a Tetris USB drive. EXT4 <laughs> data corruption bug hits Linux kernel. I can't live with that kind of stuff. Um, we actually have a data collection device that uses Linux because it uses a Raspberry Pi and there is a free BSD port to the Raspberry Pi but you know, it's a system on a chip and all this stuff, and I think the Linux thing is better. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it is uh, going to always kind of more be able to use all the capabilities of the, of the chip. Um, so recently, I accidentally unplugged a Raspberry Pi right after untarring a, um, a, a big tar archive. And uh, I'm like, oh no, let's see what happened. And I rebooted and the tar archive was untarred. All of the directory structure was there, all of the files were there, and all of the files were empty. Every single file. 
which is almost the worst possible result that I can imagine. The only thing I think would be worse if the file length were correct and the data was random. But, but you know, an empty file is an incorrect file when it's supposed to have data in it. Uh, that would never happen on the, uh, on the UFS, on the fast file system, on ZFS, on any of the Berkeley file systems. Uh, you, you don't get files that show up with no data in them after a crash. Um, Here's an equation I came up with for you guys. A billion dollars plus Linus is less than or equal to good people with a rigorous engineering process doing BSD. And I wasn't sure about the... All right, I like that. I wasn't sure if that should be, that maybe should be a minus sign, you know, because the, everything flowing through this one guy, and I get he's had a lot of rigor, and I get he's, he's maintained a certain degree of something with that, but give me, a, give me a systems engineering process that's being followed over a guy anytime. Uh, also, BSC has a secret weapon, and what is that secret weapon? In my opinion, ZFS. Uh, yeah. You know, it's kind of amazing, and especially as the capacity of drives increases, it starts to, you start looking at what are, what's the likelihood if I write a file into a file system that I can get the file back, and it's truly alarming. There are some, there are some papers out uh, that go into all this. Uh, these guys showed drives have firmware bugs where the drive will not report a I.O. complete that was complete, where a drive will report an I.O. complete that was not requested, where a drive will write the block to the wrong place on the disk and report the I.O. complete. Okay, like every imaginable way for a drive to malfunction has been documented as occurring. Okay, then we back out from there to the disk controller and guess what? Bugs. Then we back up from there to the RAID controller, and guess what? Bugs. Then we back up from there, we have driver bugs, we have file system bugs. It's kind of a miracle to actually that we can get files back um, <laughs> after we write them in. After, after you, if you actually go track down one of those papers, because they're not hard to find, and you read through it, you're going to go, oh my god. Uh, I won't go into the whole detail, but there's a thing called the RAID, uh, the RAID write hole. And basically, any kind of RAID 5 type system is at risk for silent data corruption that you won't discover until one of your drives fails. Um, and of course, if that data corruption is the super block or you know, the home directory or something like that, it could be pretty ugly. All right, so open source. It kind of works and it kind of doesn't work. And, and where it works, I think it depends on the project, all right? The, you know, I think that open source favors projects where we can come up with objective criteria for what good is. That's things like um, compilers and operating systems, okay? So for example, with the, with the operating system, we can, we can test competing scheduling algorithms and we can, we can agree, hey, this thing's really responsive. It's more responsive with this algorithm than this other algorithm. Where, we, where open source seems to not do so well is in um, things where it's more of an aesthetic question. You know, I think if Steve Jobs had been an open source guy instead of an Apple guy, but he had all the skill that he developed in all those years of making Apple happen, how would he interact with our community? He'd be sending out long emails about how things should work. And what people would do is they would flame him and they would tell him to go implement it if he felt so strongly about it. <laughs> All right, and uh, I want to talk for a second about GNU versus BSD licensing. Um, in the GNU versus BSD camp, I am firmly in the Berkeley camp. I prefer the greater permissiveness of the BSD license, and I'm unconcerned if others profit from my work. I'm unconcerned if others take my work and extend it and don't give it back. With the language I contribute the most to, Tickle, and the database we use, Postgres, BSD license projects, and in my opinion, fewer shenanigans. And, and shenanigans being like what happened with MySQL, although I kind of put MySQL in the Linux camp as far as fishiness, because um, you know, Magnus at the beginning of My, MySQL said that transactions are bull crap. And uh, anybody who wants to write databases and doesn't think transactions are important is just coming from it from somewhere I can't wrap my head around. 
that being said, I do feel a great deal of gratitude to Richard Stallman uh, for GCC. Uh, a key piece for so much open source for such a long time and a huge advance from the crummy for pay feature incomplete compilers that we were using before. Like we really d are standing on his shoulders. Um, so kind of to conclude here, you can build enterprise class applications around BSD. I know a lot of you who are here are doing that. Netflix is a great example. Uh, you can build an enterprise around BSD. And last of all, I want to say thank you. Things are better than they've ever been. Our software is better than it's ever been. You're doing God's work, okay? Good engineering can be giant wads of money, and we, and we see that. So have a great conference, and uh, thanks for inviting me, and I'm really glad you guys are here. That's it. Thank you.